Happy Sabbath, everyone. It's wonderful to be back home at Truth Triumphant. Been out the last few weeks. A couple weeks ago, I was on a Zoom program with um, some Seventh-day Adventist brethren over in the Soviet, well, not Soviet Union anymore. It's Russia. Uh, so that went very well. We had it for about I don't know, two to three hour program together. And talked about everything from the war going on in the Ukraine with Russia to 1888 and Jones and Wagner to righteousness by faith and everything in between. There's a lot of brethren over there in Russia and uh, as I remember from a previous Zoom program we had, um, there were people from all over Europe who were actually tuned in to that Zoom program. So we had a very good time together. Uh, it went very, very well. Um, then last Sabbath, I was down in South Florida with a group down there near uh, Fort Lauderdale, Miami area and we had several meetings together. So, uh, praise the Lord, it's great to be back, and uh, I'm thrilled to be here with you this morning. Uh, in fact, uh, coming up soon, we're going to be on a Zoom program over to uh, Okinawa, over uh, near south of Japan. So that will be coming in the next few weeks, I believe. But uh, praise the Lord, uh, God has his children all over the world, friends, and they are preparing for what is coming on this earth in preparation for the coming of the Son of Man. You know, I'd like to uh, just make one other comment before we have prayer and get into our talk this morning on Adventist obsession, uh, and that is uh, we... Of course, are thrilled with our uh, YouTube uh, opportunity to put videos on the YouTube. That's why you're watching uh, at this time. Uh, but we're also uh, going on to Rumble, uh, Brighteon, and Bitchuke, which are also uh, channels where you can go on to those places and uh, find our videos as well. I know uh, Cody and Hilda are, are uh, working very quickly to get all our videos, uh, not only on the YouTube, but also again onto Rumble, Brighteon, and Bitchuke. So uh, check those out. There are a few things that we have up on, on those channels that uh, well, for lack of a better word, we weren't able to put onto the YouTube channel. So uh, anyway, again, those are things that we are in the process of doing in case something were to happen uh, where uh, we weren't able to broadcast on one of the uh, places, then we would have them on the other three uh, as well. So anyway, that's what we're doing, and uh, we're grateful for the opportunity to do evangelism through the YouTube channel. Of course, it's just one of the ways that uh, we are doing it. We, of course, are doing mass mailings every week. We uh, send literature all over the world during the week. Some folk have the idea that I sit in an ivory tower during the week and just study. Uh, but that couldn't be further from the truth. For about two to three hours every day, I'm in my uh, office back there in the fellowship hall of our church, uh, stuffing boxes full of spirit of prophecy and Bibles and my books and Jan Markison's book, uh, The National Sunday Law. And we're shipping them all over the world, friends. So praise the Lord. Um, I'm noticing here recently, lately, that uh, getting responses and requests from 
uh, Mexico, uh, which we have filled, and uh, a dear lady here at our church, Maria, and her dear husband, Jose Tabares, they uh, gave me a contact down in Colombia where we sent several boxes down to Colombia of Spanish literature. Uh, I've sent a number of boxes to Mexico where they are doing evangelism. And I just had another gentleman that I sent to yesterday in Peru. So uh, starting to see some doors opening in the uh, Central and Latin, uh, Central America and South America as well uh, to go along with, uh, you know, Africa, the Philippines, uh, India, Europe, and North America and Canada. So praise God uh, for the opportunities that we have to do this incredible work of proclaiming the three angels' messages. So we will go ahead uh, after Paul makes a comment, we'll have prayer. Paul? Well, about the South American, uh, uh, Central and, and Mexican area of the continent, uh, for decades, Rome has had that so locked down. Billy Graham went down there, drove tens of thousands of people back to the Catholic Church. Um, you got to look into that statement because it's a fact. And mm -hmm. now, and I know a lot of people are against what's going on at the border. I am, simply from a legal point of view. However, Absolutely. these people are going to be hearing this message and they're going to want to bring it back and give it to their people in South America. The same thing happened in Israel mm -hmm. when all the people would come and they would hear what the apostles had to say. Look at the Ethiopian treasurer, one example. So right. while, yes, it's a legal issue, it's also the Lord making these people available, people available to hear the third angel's message that left in that environment, they would never hear it any other way. So praise God. Again, he's using this country. Amen, Paul. Absolutely. Absolutely. So we're, we're excited. We're thankful for the evangelistic opportunities that we have that remain the focal point, and it must remain the focal point of any group, any individual who wants to continue on in a vibrant uh, relationship with God in sharing his truth with other people. So having said that, let's go ahead and kneel for prayer. Dear Father in heaven, we're grateful for your amazing grace. Uh, we're so thankful for that this morning. Uh, we are thankful for the gift of the Holy Spirit. We pray for his presence here this morning in all that we do say, think that you would be glorified and honored. Uh, we're thankful for the promise in John 14 where Jesus said, I will not leave you comfortless. I will come to you. We claim that promise today, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. Adventist obsession. What could that possibly be about? <laughs> Cody and I were joking, teasing about it this morning. You know, maybe uh, a year or two years from now, we could, we could be on Adventist Obsession Part 65 because there are so many things that Seventh-day Adventists obsess over and it's not the proclamation and the sharing of the truth of God for this time. And, and what, a, what a sad, what a pathetic, what a pathetic statement to have to make. Our obsession should be the sharing of the three angels' messages. 
the sanctuary message, the investigative judgment, uh, the perpetuity of the law of God and the seventh-day Sabbath from eternity to eternity in existence and binding on the human family. Uh, the fact that the only way that we can keep God's law is through faith in Jesus Christ. And then, of course, the, the warning of the second and the third angel's messages of the fall of apostate Protestant churches in and around the time of the 1840s. And then, of course, the third angel's message that is a trumpet, a clarion call to the planet that if we honor and revere the papal power, the beast of Revelation 14 and verse 9, and apostate Protestantism, its image, and receive that mark, that Sunday mark of rebellion in our minds, in our hearts, and carry it out in our lives, we'll receive of God's wrath. You know, friends, to share those messages and to let nothing else get in the way of that, that should be our obsession. But tragically, tragically it isn't. Seventh-day Adventists have become obsessed with so many things. Feast days, the Holy Spirit isn't a person. Uh, Jesus died on Wednesday. The church is Babylon. Uh, you got to be in the church to be saved. Uh, time setting. Uh, the flat earth. I mean, it, it goes on and on and on and on. We are obsessed with distractions. Tragic, pathetically. Not prophetic. Well, yeah, it is prophetic because Ellen White said it would happen. <laughs> but it's pathetic as well. Well, this morning we're going to look at one, and I'd like to start it off by... We have... Today we have people... You know, I was sent a video of a gentleman saying, you know, by, the, by 2023, there's going to be an economic collapse that will bring in a Sunday law. And then I got something else that, uh, well, and when I was in South Florida last Sabbath, where they were talking about 2024, something happening in 2024, and, and then, of course, there's those that are saying, you know, by 2027, when I was on the Zoom with the people in Russia, there were people making little notes on the side while I was speaking about not setting time, and they were saying, oh, 2027, you know, that's when Jesus is going to come because... Uh, you know, he began his ministry in 27 AD, and that was when the earth was 4,000 years old. So by 2027 will be 6,000 years, and then Jesus will come to usher in the 7,000th uh, year, the 7th millennium. And then you got people talking about 2030. Uh, when the, the uh, Agenda 21 will take place, and that will surely bring in martial law. I mean, folk, you know, at some point, somebody is going to be right. They really will. Somebody will get it. Why? Because we've, we've done every year. Uh, by the way, 2025 and 2026, I haven't heard those yet, so probably the next one we'll hear from some uh, hairball hair or, or cross-eyed individual will be that Jesus is coming in 2025 or, uh, you know, there'll be a Sunday law in 2025 and then uh, the great time of trouble in 2026. Folk, come on. That's not our message. That's not our message on obsessing over time and making that our core belief. 
we're obsessed. Are we obsessed with proclaiming the three angels' messages? I wish we were. Oh, I wish we were, friends. But we get distracted on everything else. Are we obsessed with walking in the light of the spirit of prophecy? If only that were the case. I wish that were the case, friends. Cody, go ahead. I just want to give a word of caution to the folks that um, are doing the work. Don't let these people who are off on all these side tangents distract you from the work you've been given to do in proclaiming the third angel's message, because that's Amen. exactly what they do. Amen. And be very careful when someone comes up to you and says, oh, I know that you are searching for truth and that you are really close to God, and, and, and I think I can share this truth with you. Be very, very cautious when someone starts their pitch to you like that. Absolutely, Cody. Appreciate that, that thought. Absolutely. Are we obsessed with sowing the spirit of prophecy books like the leaves of autumn? That would be wonderful, wouldn't it? That would be wonderful. Obsessed with submission to Christ and having victory over sin. Tragically, that couldn't be further from the truth. We're obsessed with everything but what God wants. No truer words were spoken. We're obsessed with everything but what God really wants from each one of us. Paul, go ahead. People better wake up at Venice because I read the quote where Mrs. White says that God will most assuredly, she uses those words, cut the work short in mercy. So when you're setting these dates and times, they're not a given. Nothing is a given anymore. When you read a quote like that, what does that mean? Most assuredly, she says, will cut the work short. So beware, there's only one business that we have to do, and that is spreading the third angel's message. And it's the only way to receive the latter rain. Amen, Paul, absolutely. Good point, good point. We're obsessed, friends, with setting time. We want to figure out when Jesus will come. We want to be able to determine when a Sunday law will come and then when Christ will return. We're obsessed with this in spite of Ellen White's oft-repeated statements to the contrary. I was shocked. I was shocked to find the, the many, many times because... Since 1844, Seventh-day Adventists, or quasi-Seventh-day Adventists, have been coming along setting dates. That went on throughout the 19th century. And Ellen White constantly had to deal with people that were into that mode of obsession. Notice some of these amazing statements, so simple and so plain. Notice, early writings, pages 74 and 75. Time has not been a test since 1844. And it will never again be a test. Did you hear that, friends? How much simpler and plainer could it be? The Lord has shown me that the message of the third angel must go and be proclaimed to the scattered children of the Lord, but it must not be hung on time. It must not be hung on time, friends. If somebody comes along is giving a good message and saying, oh, by the way, at such and such a time, this is going to... No, they just hung the message on time. I saw that some were getting a false excitement arising from preaching time, but the third angel's message is stronger than time can be. I saw that this message can stand on its own foundation and needs not time to strengthen it. 
It will go in mighty power and do its work and will be cut short in righteousness. Friends, if there were no other statements from the spirit of prophecy, this one statement right here is so clear and plain. So when you hear people saying, well, at this time, this is going to... Friends, when a date is put, a future date is placed in connection with the giving of the three angels' messages, shut them down. Turn off the DVD. Don't listen to them because it's wrong. Ellen White couldn't be any clearer. She says people, when they preach time, they're getting up a false excitement. That's what it is. Cody? Let me play devil's advocate here and, and ask you the question, or pose to you, rather, that, okay, so time is not a test. So it's not going to be a test for the world, but it's a special revelation for God's people, the Seventh-day Adventist Church, in the last time. So it's not a test for the world, but it's still information that we should know as Adventists. What would you say to somebody who said that to you? Cody, I would point them right back to what Ellen White just said in pages 74 and 75 of early writings. It's a false excitement. It's not special light. It's not special information for God's people. It's a false excitement. And if something is false, we have, we have in the great controversy, we have something things that are true. We have things that are false. What is true comes from the Lord and His Word. What is false comes from the devil and his demons. So a message based on time, where does it come from? It's not coming from the Lord. It's coming from the devil to create an excitement. Cody, go ahead. And then I guess the follow-up would be what happens to people that buy into that false uh, excitement? What, what is the end state of that if the time comes and nothing happens? We, we will see statements here as we go forward in this talk. What happens, Cody, is when the time comes and the event foretold does not happen, people lose faith. People throw in the towel. They think that God has has failed them and they blame God for their own foolishness in following a person presenting a message on time that's what happens another statement some were led into the error some were led into the error of repeatedly fixing upon a definite time for the coming of Christ. What did Ellen White call it? An error. Where does error come from, friends? The light which is, was now shining on the subject should have shown them that no prophetic period extends to the second advent. Did you hear that, friend? No prophetic period extends to the second advent. I've been listening to people for years tell me that the prophecies in Daniel 12, the 1260, 1290, and 1335, that the 1335 comes all the way down. I've seen their pretty charts. I just got a book from England. I don't remember the guy's name. I got it this week, in which the man was saying that the time periods in Daniel chapter 12 are yet in the future. Friend, shut them down. I heard Doug Batchelor 
I heard Doug Batchelor give a talk on Daniel 12 where he said, there's two possible views. Either it's prophetic time or it's literal time in the future. No, it's not. No, it's not, friends. Turning from the light, they continued to set time after time for the Lord to come. And as often, they were disappointed. The apostles' admonition to the Thessalonians contains an important lesson for those who live in the last days. Many Adventists have felt that unless they could fix their faith upon a definite time for the Lord's coming, they could not be zealous and diligent in the work of preparation. What? Friends, that's, that's procrastination. That's saying, okay, if I know the Lord's coming in 2027, then, you know, I'm going to live it up till about 2026 in the summer, and then for the last six months of 2026, I'm going to start being diligent in pre preparing for the Lord to come. That's ridiculous, friends. It's ridiculous. That's saying that, that following the devil and, and his insanity and his perversions, that that's the way to go in life? Friends, that's hell on earth. That's hell on earth. Paul, go ahead. My brother had that very view. Oh, when I see this happen, I'm going to change. He died over a year ago. There you go, Paul. And he Paul. never made, as far as I know, never made that change. There you go. Anyhow, this bill is not a new issue. What was said to Peter on the beach just before Christ's ascension about, well, I thought... This was going to end. He was not going to see death before he returned. Jesus said, that's none of your business. Feed my sheep. And Peter accepted that. What's wrong with us? And many of these people that, and I've dealt with them time and time again over the last 25 years, et cetera, et cetera, do not believe in anything Ellen Wright wrote past a certain date. Why is that? <laughs> they lump her in. They take unpublished works and then, oh, see, see, see. Well, it wasn't published because it was incorrect because the whites were learning too early on. So, you know what? We need to be about our father's business, period. Amen, Paul. Absolutely. Absolutely. Cody, go ahead. I just want to... Doesn't work. Okay. I'll go on until you get it ready. But as their hopes are again and again excited, only to be destroyed, their faith receives such a shock that it becomes well nigh impossible for them to be impressed by the great truths of prophecy. Did you hear what Ellen White said there, friends? When people set time, they get excited. They say, oh, it's going to happen now. So they get, there's an excitement. But when it doesn't happen, their faith is destroyed. Their re faith receives such a shock, it becomes well nigh impossible for them to be impressed by the great truths of prophecy. Friends, setting time leads to destruction of faith. That's what it does. Cody, go ahead. I just wanted to point out, I think that you gave here from the Spirit of Prophecy the strongest possible reason why that time setting would be an impossibility in God's eyes past 1844. Because right here is the revelation of the carnal heart in that there are people that feel like they couldn't be zealous and diligent unless they had a time prophecy period. That's exactly why there is not one. Because God is looking for those who will trust him, follow him, and love him, and be zealous workers regardless of whether they have a thousand years left or one day left. Amen, Cody. Amen. 
And for, to me, that solidifies there, coming from the Holy Spirit, that there's no chance that there's a time prophecy. There's no chance that time setting could ever be true in any context because God knows our hearts, <clears throat> and it's revealed right there. Amen, Cody. Amen, absolutely. Going on, this is from Great Controversy 456-457. Ellen White goes on, the preaching of a definite time for the judgment and the giving of the first angel's message was ordered of God. There's no doubt about that. 1844, the 2300-year prophecy of Daniel chapters 8 and 9, that was ordained of heaven. The computation of the prophetic periods on which that message was based. Placing the close of the 2300 days in the autumn of 1844 stands without impeachment. The repeated efforts to find new dates for the beginning and close of the prophetic periods and the unsound reasoning necessary to sustain these positions not only lead minds away from the present truth, but throw contempt upon all efforts to explain the prophecies. The more frequently a time is set for the second advent, the more widely it is taught, the better it suits. Wow, it suits who? <laughs> it suits the purposes of Satan. The more frequently a time is set for the second advent, the more widely it is taught, the better it suits the purposes of Satan. After the time has passed, he excites ridicule and contempt of its advocates. This casts reproach upon the great advent movement of 1843 and 1844. Those who persist in this error will at last fix upon a date too far in the future for the coming of Christ. Thus, they will be led to rest in a false security, and many will not be undeceived until it is too late. Friends, this statement is huge. It is so full of counsel. Setting time, saying Jesus is coming then. This suits the purposes of the devil, it says. And when it doesn't happen, it casts reproach on the original time prophecy of the 2300 years. Wow. There were many proclaiming a new time after 1844, but I was shown that we should not have another definite time to proclaim to the people. How much clearer, how much plainer could Ellen White be? There is no time after 1844. How much clearer could she be? Now, this is one of the people, and we'll mention her momentarily. Marion Barry. Fancy charts. Taking the time periods of Daniel 12. Putting them from the time of the Sunday law till the time of the voice of God just before the second coming. Friends, setting dates for the second coming, for the Sunday law, and the time of trouble. Cody? A lot of times these times come out of obviously Daniel chapter 12, sure. at which point to 1843 and, uh, and 508. So if we're looking at those time periods, what, and we, we duly apply that, what does that do to the original uh, time periods and what they meant in a prophetic sense. Cody, <laughs> a gentleman I worked with at the Pacific Press many, many years ago, decades ago now, I went to his home. He had these fancy charts. 
And he shows me how the prophecies were fulfilled in history. And then he showed me the second application where he applied them to the future in literal time. Now, Cody, if I was inclined that way, I would have looked and said, well, the old time periods, that's ancient. That, that's back in the 19th century. We're in the 21st century. And if I was inclined that way, I would look at those reapplying of the time periods of Daniel 12, making them literal time. I would have become excited and elated to say, oh, great, we've got a road map all the way down to the second coming of Jesus. And it would have done exactly as Ellen White said in my mind. It would have created and stimulated an excitement. But it would have caused tremendous procrastination saying, okay, well, at the time of the Sunday law, I'll get right with the Lord. What? I'm going to live in the hellish throes of sin in this world? And then when the Sunday law passes, I'm going to get right with God? By then it's going to be too late, friends. It will be too late. Ellen White said, I was shown we should not have another definite time to proclaim to the people. I have borne but one testimony in regard to the setting of time. I have been repeatedly urged to accept different periods of time proclaimed for the Lord to come. But I have ever had but one testimony to bear. The Lord will not come at that period, and you are weakening the faith even of Adventists and fastening the world in their unbelief. Their oft-repeated message of definite time was exactly what the enemy wanted, and it served his purpose well to unsettle the faith in the first proclamation of time that was of heavenly origin. Now one of the major proponents of reapplying the prophecies of Daniel 12, just as I read in a book this week from a guy in England, taking the prophecies of Daniel 12 putting them down at the end of time and making them literal time. Friends, one of those people was Marion Barry. Fancy charts in her books. Oh, really fancy, all colorful, color-coded. You know what that does, friend, to the character of God? Daniel chapter 7, we say the time, times, and half a time, the 1260 years from 538 to 1798. That's what we say it is in Daniel 7. But then five chapters later, the time, times, and half a time in Daniel 12 and verse 7. Well, now that's literal time. What have we just done to the character of God? In five chapters, God is so confused, he can't make up his mind. In one chapter, it's prophetic time. In another chapter, it's literal time. I thought Malachi 3 and verse 6 was a biblical principle. For I am the Lord, I change not. I thought that's what scripture teaches. What was prophetic time in Daniel 7? It's prophetic time in Daniel chapter 12.
Ever since 1844, I have borne my testimony that we are now in a period of time in which we are to take heed to ourselves, lest our hearts be overcharged with surfeiting and drunkenness and cares of this life, so that that day come upon us unawares. Our position has been one of waiting and watching with no time proclamation to intervene between the close of the prophetic periods in 1844 and the time of the Lord's coming. Now, what part of that statement do we not understand? How much clearer could Ellen White be? No time proclamation to intervene between the close of the prophetic periods in 1844 and the time of the Lord's coming. Away with 2023. Away with 2027. Away with 2030. Away with all time periods, friends. We need to humble our hearts before the Lord and allow his righteousness to be king in our lives. Period. We have not cast away our confidence, neither have we a message dependent upon definite time. Letter 38, 1888, manuscript release number 1210. Well, maybe some of you remember this well-known Adventist minister, David Gates. Back in like 2015 or 2016, where he said that by the spring of 2019 or 2020, that there would be a Sunday law. And David Gates figured it out all based on the three and a half years between uh, the first Roman general in 66 surrounding Jerusalem, and he applied that to Francis coming to America. And then three and a half years later, Titus comes in 70 AD, and David Gates applies that and he says three and a half years after Francis came, there would be a Sunday law. And so people from all over the world, Adventists from Australia and the South Pacific and Africa and Europe and Canada and America are emailing me and saying, did you hear this present truth of David Gates? There's going to be a Sunday law at, at such and such a date. Friends, that's a message based on time. Did it happen? No. Is David Gates a false teacher? Yes. And yet we still listen. We still heed what he says. We're a pathetic people, friends. Pathetic people. And anybody that claims to have a message on time, it will surely fail. And if we're hanging on that, our faith will fail too. The Lord showed me first selected messages, page 188, Arthur Branner. The Lord showed me that the message must go, that it must not be hung on time. For time will never be a test again. I saw that some were getting a false excitement arising from preaching time. That's what David Gates and Arthur Brenner were doing, friends. These two men were preaching time and it was creating excitement. Oh, this is exciting. The Sunday law is coming. And we can tell you exactly when it will. It was excitement, friends. It was destroying people's faith. Arthur Branner, 
David Gates combined together to proclaim that message. Totally opposite of what Ellen White said. Why don't we get it, friends? Why won't we listen to what the prophet said? What a novel idea, huh? What a novel idea. Revelation chapter 10 and verse 6. The Bible says, I swear by him that liveth forever and ever who created heaven and the things that are therein and the earth and the things that therein are and the sea that there should be time no longer from 1844 friends till the time of Christ's coming there is no message on time period Period, friends. And if you're listening to somebody who's proclaiming messages based on time, you will fail as will they and their time periods. And then, of course, you get the holy saintly Adventists who give Ellen White a rubber nose. I remember back in the late 70s, early 80s, there was a man, a Anglican pastor by the name of Jeffrey Paxton, wrote a book an Anglican pastor called the Shaking of Adventism. He gave a talk, he came to America and he said, you know, I can, I can give Ellen White a rubber nose. I can get her to say anything I want, any position I want. You can say that she says don't set time. I can, give, I can show you where she said you can. Friends, do we give Ellen White a rubber nose? Can we twist her however we want to? That's what many Adventists are doing today, and I'll show you how they do it. They say, Ellen White said Jesus came to the earth after 4,000 years of sin. Great, he did. Absolutely. But here's where they're wrong they begin to state dates. So at what point was it that the earth was 4,000 years when Jesus came? Was that at his birth? Was that when he went to the temple at 12 years old? Was that when he was baptized in 27 AD? What date are you going to choose, friend? Well, let's see now. Uh, Ellen White doesn't give a specific, it's not specific, friends, so that we can hang a new message on time. But many Adventists do. So what they do is they compute it from 27, and they say it's been 2,000 years since then. Therefore, Jesus will return in 2027, because the earth will be 6,000 years old at that time. Thus saith Ellen White. No, she didn't, friend. Your fevered brain, your fevered brain adopted that idea. Ellen White didn't say that. Those who make a big deal about the earth being 6,000 years old and Jesus coming during the seventh millennium are dead wrong. Dead wrong. There is nothing, there is nothing in 2027 as a prophetic date. Hogwash, friends, hogwash. No one knows exactly how old the earth is. 
No one knows exactly how old the earth was when Jesus came and exactly what time or year Ellen White is stating. Nobody knows that, friends. No one knows whether it be 2023, 20, 24, 25, 26, 27, or 2030 when the Sunday law will happen, when probation will close, and when Jesus will come. No one. No one, friends. Those are all messages, distractions, excitement to divert us from the messages and the mission that we are to accomplish. All that stuff, friends, setting dates and times and trying to use Ellen White to support it is this right here. Garbage. I don't care who the person was who said it. It's garbage. When Ellen White says there are no more messages on time and we use her to make a message on time, we are making of none effect her writings. We're giving her a rubber nose, friends. And she didn't have a rubber nose. First selected messages, page 48. The very last deception of Satan will be to make of none effect the testimony of the Spirit of God. You try to make Ellen White talk out of both sides of your, her mouth, you have made of none effect her writings, friends. And you are being used by the devil to do that. Satan will work ingeniously in different ways through different agencies to unsettle the confidence of God's remnant people in the true testimony. Closing, friends. Review and Herald, July 23, 1895. We're now living in the closing scenes of this world's history. Let men tremble with the sense of the responsibility of knowing the truth. The ends of the world are come. Proper consideration of these things will lead all to make an entire consecration of all that they have and are to their God. The weighty obligation of warning a world of its coming doom is upon us from every direction calls are coming to us for help. The church is to carry the message to the world. Crowns, immortal crowns are to be won. The kingdom of heaven is to be gained. A world is to be enlightened. The lost pearl is to be found. The lost sheep is to be brought back in safety to the fold. Who will join in the search? Who will bear the light to those who are wandering in the darkness of error? Let's get into that work, friends of calling people to the marriage supper of the Lamb, calling people to the coming of Christ and a preparation of heart and mind to the will of God. May that be, friends, may that be the burden of our hearts, the joy of our lips, Let us pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much for your amazing grace that calls us again today to proclaim your messages to this planet and not to become sidetracked by false teachers who are setting time. 
Thank you for the plain statements of the spirit of prophecy. Forgive us for seeking to twist and finagle them into saying things that Ellen White never said. Forgive us for our pathetic blindness and strengthen us today to resist all time setting and to embrace all messages that would proclaim your truths to a dying and lost world. In Jesus' name, amen.